The hard-working student who dreamt of becoming a teacher murdered in cold blood just two weeks ago. Someone decided that, you know, that, that his life was cheap. And it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't at all. He was killed with a single stab wound to the heart. Tell us tonight, who did it? Hello and welcome to Crime Watch. We're going to have more on the callous murder of student Sam Gadira very soon. But first, let's take a look at some of the other cases that we need your help with tonight. Detectives are here live in the studio ready for your calls. They are convinced that someone watching will be able to name this suspected rapist who chased and attacked a young woman in Manchester city centre. When you're struggling and you can't, and you, you're just not able to move, you just think, why well, can't I move? Why can't you, like, get off? It's awful. And the 96-year-old great-grandmother who suffered an horrific death after the bed she was sleeping in was deliberately set alight. Her daughter is desperate to know who could do such a thing. She's just so greatly missed by the family from these great-grandchildren who can't understand how someone could murder the Nana when Nana was lying on a bed, sleeping. How could somebody set fire to her? If you do know anything about that, then do get in touch. Matthew's here with this month's collection of Wanted Faces. Matthew. Yes, and tonight we've got people wanted for robbery, indecent assault and even people trafficking. If you recognise any of them, just pick up the phone. We've also got some crucial news, CCTV, from the Allenwood murder inquiry. He was the 50-year-old gardener, tortured and brutally killed in his own home in a remote part of rural Lincolnshire 16 months ago. I don't think any mother expects to lose live longer than their children. Detectives hope these new pictures could help finally solve this terrible crime. And Matthew, what else have you got for us? It's the fascinating story of how police prove the guilt of a gang of murderers as a result of a DNA match. But the sample didn't belong to any of them or even the victim. It actually came from one of the killer's dogs. We were building a real picture of what had happened. But we were lacking in forensic evidence that would knit it together. What we did have was a curious amount of dog hairs. 24-year-old student Sam Gadira dreamt of becoming a teacher, passionately believing that he could make a difference to young people's lives. He had a loving family and many friends who cared for him deeply. But just 16 days ago, someone decided to cut this promising young life short. that horrific picture of how frightened was he when he died and the fear. When he was your child. What did he go through in his last moments? And why someone so innocent could just be cut down like that. And it just rips you apart. Just over two weeks ago, 24-year-old student Sam Gadira was found fighting for his life in the middle of this road here in Sydenham in south-east London. He'd been the target of a violent and unprovoked attack. Very caring, isn't it? Yeah, very family-orientated. Um, not just to his brothers and sisters, but his nieces and that. Just everybody in the family loved him. We met when we were 17. He was, he was really funny, really intelligent, um, you know, really kind. Sam was doing history and politics at uh, Greenwich University, and his great passion was to teach history. He just believed, once he started teaching, that he could actually make a difference. 
to youngsters' yeah. lives. He just had that impact when you, you, know, you met him for the first time. Yeah, it's like if you met him today, you wouldn't forget him. Sam had um, gone to watch football uh, with his friends in the day. Um, and we'd arranged to, to meet up after work uh, and have a drink together. It said, I'll, I'll phone you after work and, and we'll sort something out, but my battery had died. And um, I said to him, you know, you won't be able to get hold of me, just come and meet me at 10 o'clock. So what exactly do detectives know about Sam's last movements that evening? Well, CCTV shows Sam arriving here at Penji Station at 9.34. Moments later, Sam paused outside this food and wine store, only yards from the station exit. Pack of ten Mayfairs, please. Oh, lovely. Thanks very much. Cheers. Bye bye. At 9:36, Sam left the shop and headed north up Newlands Park towards the bus stop. Just minutes later, another train arrived, and around 30 people left the station the same way he had. Any one of them may have seen what happened next. It was so unlike him not to turn up. And I tried to call him. I remember sitting there thinking, please answer your phone, please answer your phone, please just pick up the phone. As his attacker fled the scene, Sam desperately tried to call 999, but he'd been stabbed fatally through the heart. <laughs> the emergency services battled to save his life, but he died just an hour later. They obviously let us in to see him. It still didn't seem real. I just thought he was going to wake up. And, yeah, when we get home, they're going to phone us up and say um, that uh, he's OK. There can be no justification for such a senseless waste of life. Someone out there must know who did this. And now is the time to come forward. You know, someone's responsible for it. Someone decided that, you know, that, that his life was cheap. And yet it wasn't, you know, it wasn't at all. There is no rhyme or reason why he's been killed. And, it's, it's, you know, he hasn't didn't have his life, he was just, it was just beginning for him. That's something that we've got to sit and suffer with for the rest of our life. It's just like part of your heart being cut out. Just a tragedy for that family. DCI Lawrence Smith from the Metropolitan Police is investigating the murder. Welcome, Lawrence. Um, why do you think that this young man was targeted? Well, we think, in all probability, the motive for the attack was robbery. Right. And we know that night uh, that Sam died was carrying a black wallet. That wallet is now missing. Yeah, I mean, that is uh, surely the, the crucial, the key bit of evidence, potentially, yeah? Yes, most definitely. Although the wallet was quite unremarkable in itself, it did yeah. contain Sam's unique Greenwich University student ID card, which would have had his photograph and name thereon. OK. Now, look, yeah, if somebody finds that just lying in a gutter, lying in a garden, they need to talk to that you. That would assist in its identification, it's, yes. It certainly would. Um, we want to look at this CCTV again. We, yes. we saw some of it in the reconstruction. Yes. Give us, tell us what we're looking at, Lawrence, and give us the timeline then. Okay. Let's take a look. What you have is Sam arriving at Penji Station. He's then crossing the footbridge. 
He then enters a local convenience store, he buys a packet of cigarettes. He then leaves the store and makes his way towards Newlands Park and the bus stop. Right. Now, we, we have more CCTV. Now, this is really important because people might see themselves in this and say, hold on a minute, why am I important? Let's take a look. Well, we know about five minutes after uh, Sam arrived at the station, another train arrived, originating from Victoria, and about 30-plus people got off that train. We need these people to come forward. They may have seen something that could assist our investigation. Yeah, they could be really, really important and they don't even know it. And that is why you Most should definitely. get in touch. Yeah, thanks for now, Lawrence. So, were you in the area of Penge East Station? It was between 9.30 and 10 p.m. on the 12th of this month. That was just a couple of weeks ago. Please, if you know anything that you think might help, then please do get in touch. Call us now, 0500 600 600. Or you could call the independent charity, Crime Stoppers. You can do that anonymously. There's their number, 0800 555 one. Now, Rav is away this month, so here's Matthew with the first of tonight's Wanted Faces. Well, first on the board tonight is Fred Burrows. The 21-year-old is wanted by police for a fray. Take a look at this CCTV, which shows Burrows threatening staff with a knife in a pub in Aberystwyth. He was arrested but failed to answer bail. Police believe Burrows may be in the Brighton area. Number two tonight is Anastasios Papas. The 42-year-old has been convicted of trafficking women for sexual exploitation and controlling prostitutes in Oxford. Many of the women were foreign nationals who police believe have been trafficked into the country. Papas, who's Greek, also uses the name Mark White and has links to Maidenhead, Windsor and London. Now, the next two on the board are Manjit and Guljit Singh. They're brothers who are wanted in connection to a violent attack on a man in Kent in January 2010, during which the victim was hit over the head with a whiskey bottle. He suffered a serious wound which needed more than 20 stitches. Manjit is thought to be around 27, Guljit around 25. They have links to London and Scotland. Neither brother speaks English very well. Now, all of tonight's wanted faces are on the Crime Watch website at bbc.co.uk forward slash Crime Watch. If you know where any of them are, pick up the phone and let us know 0500 600 600 or you can text 63399 crime space and then your message. It is important to leave that space or your message won't get through. Now, this next case does really beggar belief. This month, uh, great grandmother Edith Stewart should have been celebrating her 97th birthday. But in October last year, as she was settling down for the night in her care home in Lancashire, unbelievably, someone deliberately set fire to her bed. She suffered terrible 50% burns. And 30 agonizing hours later, she died. Mrs. Stewart's daughters are, of course, devastated by the loss of their mother. She's just so greatly missed by the family from these great-grandchildren who can't understand how someone could murder their nana when nana was lying on a bed sleeping how could somebody set fire to her it, it's horrific when you when you see somebody with burns all down their arms and their hands let alone the rest of her body and you know the only place you can touch is the face and it doesn't really look like your mum anymore well, I'm joined now by Detective Superintendent Neil Essien of Lancashire Police. It is almost beyond belief, this it case. Is. It is truly shocking. What more can you tell us? Uh, Mrs Stewart is a resident at uh, Cleveley's Park Guest House, Thornton Cleveley's near Blackpool. On Monday the 18th of October last year, uh, we believe she retired to bed around 5.40 and the fire was set at about 6pm or shortly beforehand. As you can see, the, the uh, effects of the fire are shocking in them themselves. We believe the, uh, the lance of the bed was set fire to uh, using a light we found at the scene. Um, and it's just shoot, truly, truly shocking. Um, I, I mentioned 50% burns that this elderly uh, lady had. I'm imagining those final 30 hours of her life must have been, I mean, agonising, really. Yes, I think it's a testament to how strong she was for, for 96 that she did last those 30 hours. Her family were at her bedside throughout and had to witness her agony, which obviously added to their great distress. Uh, she was a lovely, lively lady, everybody says so. She enjoyed spending time with her family, her children, her, great, her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren. 
She was really looking forward to her 100th birthday. She'll be 97 this month. Everybody knew her thought she'd have no problem making 100. Terrible. Uh, now, you think that this fire, once it was set, would really have gone up very quickly? Yes, we have a reconstruction of the, uh, of the scene made by the fire brigade. Um, we believe the volante was set fire to, uh, using a lighter found at the scene. It would have gone up very quickly, and I can't believe anybody would survive this inferno, let alone a lady in the frail state that Mrs Stewart was. Um, it's four months since this happened, uh, given the shocking outcome. You reckon somebody knows who did this, don't you? I find it impossible to comprehend that anybody who's committed this shocking offence wouldn't have confided in someone, that they would have kept this terrible secret to themselves. Somebody out there knows who did this and also why they did it, and I would strongly appeal for them to come forward so we can give Mrs Stewart's family the answer they deserve. Indeed. For now, thanks very much. <coughs> Now's your chance. If you have got any information which you think could help the police in their investigation, I would urge you, please, do call our number. 0500 600 600. Now, Matthew has tonight's roundup of CCTV. Yep, and we start tonight with a nasty attack on a woman on a tube train. A young woman making her way home on a Jubilee Line underground train in London late one night in July last year. When the train stops, a man in a purple shirt eating a snack enters the carriage. He sits opposite the woman, watching her as she dozes. When the other passengers in the carriage leave at the next stop, he moves to sit next to her. Moments later, he sexually assaults her. When the train reaches its final stop at Stanmore, a member of the underground staff becomes suspicious. He gets on board to check the woman's OK. The attacker calmly leaves, makes a phone call, and even stops to have a cigarette on the way out. This man attacked a lone female late at night. Stop him before he does this, or worse, again. Name him tonight. A man dressed in biker's leathers walks into a petrol station on Paxton Road in Peterborough on a Sunday night last September. But when he pulls out a gun, it's clear he's after more than a tank of fuel. He forces the female employee to hand over more than 500 pounds in cash before making off on this rare Honda NTV 650 motorbike with a set of highly sophisticated fake number plates. Can you help unmask this armed robber? Tell us who he is tonight. Inside the Taps Bar at Sheffield Railway Station on a Thursday night last April, a group of men who've travelled from Liverpool enter the bar and order a round of drinks. A couple of minutes later, one of the guys who's wearing a cap goes outside. As he leaves, he hits a man standing near the exit with the door. Words are exchanged, and a few seconds later, the man in the cap comes back inside and lunges at the victim, smashing a pint glass in his face. The attacker's shocked friends pull him away into another part of the bar. This thug nearly cost a man his sight in a violent and vicious attack. We need to know who he is tonight. Take a good look at these two at Harvey Daly's Jewelers in Peterborough on the morning of Friday the 18th of February. They look like normal customers until one of them pulls out a gun. He holds it to the shopkeeper's head while the other jumps over the counter and starts helping himself to thousands of pounds worth of gold chains. But they've picked on the wrong man. The courageous victim fights back, literally throwing them out of his shop. And he isn't the only one to take matters into his own hands. As they try to flee, a have-a-go hero tackled them while a quick-thinking photographer snapped these. They spoke with Eastern European accents. Name them tonight. Check out this cool customer walking into a bank in Leicester last October. He waits patiently in the queue, but his interest soon runs out as he makes an unauthorised cash withdrawal, ripping a bag of money from the security guard who's making a delivery. This man made off with £25,000 in cash. We're banking on your help to name him tonight. OK, so if you know anything, please give us a call 0500 600 600 or text on 63399, type crime space, then your message. If you need a second look, go online at bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. Now, who is this man here? The detectives would love to know. He's the man suspected of brutally raping a young woman in Manchester city centre in the early hours of October the 31st. It was a terrifying attack, and much of it was caught on camera. The victim has to remain anonymous, but we'll call her Anna. 
Manchester City Centre comes alive on weekend evenings and thousands of people come here to enjoy the bars, clubs and nightlife. But last October, one man was here for far more sinister reasons. He was prowling the streets searching for a vulnerable woman to attack. For his unsuspecting victim, the consequences would be devastating. Where are we going tonight? Dean's Gate Locks. I had a brilliant night last time I went there. We can have a good dance. I know it's going to be great. I can't wait. Oh, I forgot my bag. Do you want to use my bag? Yeah, please. Um, well, we'd planned um, to go out um, on a girly night out. Um, we were all getting ready and really looking forward to it. Because um, every time we go out with a girly night, it's a really good laugh and um, you can just let your hair down, really. Right, come on, girls, let's go. We're going to be late otherwise. So we all got ready at my friends um, and then headed out for town. Come on, come on. Okay. Oh, my shoe on set. Yeah, <laughs> got it. <laughs> I was out with my friends in town. Um, she was out in town with her friends. Um, it got towards the end of the night and I decided to give her a phone call to see where she was. Oh, Dave's ringing me one minute. Right. Hi, baby, OK? You had a good night? Yeah, yeah, it's all right. I just don't know what to do now. I don't know what the girls are doing. I'm just ringing to see if you wanted to uh, share a taxi. Yeah, I'll get a taxi. OK, uh, do you know where Albert Square is? Albert Square? Yeah, it'll take me about ten minutes. OK, bye. No, I have no idea. Girls, I'm going to go. Are you gonna yeah, go? I'm going to go meet David, yeah. All right, give us a hug. And we agreed to get a taxi home together, so we just started to walk down uh, to meet him. It was a safe route, it was open, and I'd, I'd done it many of times before, knew exactly where I was and where I was going. Oh, my God, hiya! <laughs> Um, on the on the walk to meet my boyfriend, um, I saw one of my old school friends on the corner. Um, I just said a, said hello to her and was just catching up with old times for about five minutes, and then decided to call my boyfriend and just let him know where I was. And um, that that was like only a couple of minutes away from him. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm five minutes away. I'm just on Oxford Street. Okay, love you. Bye. Anna continued up Oxford Street and was now just minutes from the place where she'd arranged to meet her boyfriend but she would never make it. Unbeknownst to her, a dangerous man was now roaming the area, looking for a victim. The man followed Anna as she crossed the road into St Peter's Square. Well, when I got to St Peter's Square, I had to um, cut across the Metrolink track. Not for one minute did I think anybody was following me. Because I knew my boyfriend was only a couple of minutes away, I just decided to um, start running, really. Um, as I was, I was excited, I was giddy to see him. just screaming for my boyfriend because he knew he was like just round the corner um, but he wasn't he wasn't there and nobody nobody was doing anything and when you when you're struggling and you can't 
you're just not able to move. You just think, why can't I move? Why can't you, like, get off? It's weird. Because when, when you can't breathe, you just, it's awful. That's what I've just had to live with ever since it happened, that I could have done something. I could have been there, I could have protected her. I just couldn't, because I didn't know where she was. I'm going to have to live, live with that now. This is the spot where Anna was savagely attacked and left for dead. We're extremely concerned he might do this again and need you to help us catch him. If you know him, do the right thing and give us his name. You just don't, I don't, you just don't see people the same anymore. Like, I was a really trusting person and would probably, like, um, but now you just look at me and I'm always thinking, is, could it be you, is it you? And it shouldn't have to be like that. It, Yeah. Awful. Well, joining me now is Detective Sergeant John Connor. Thanks for joining us. Uh, John, you're leading the investigation. This young woman, she's been very brave. She's a strong girl. She's 20. Terrible things happened to her. Out of it all, though, you have some cracking CCTV that might help crack this case. Talk us through it. Someone must know who this man is. He's about 5 feet 10 tall, medium build. He's got light-coloured hair, wearing a light-coloured T-shirt and jeans. The CCTV we're viewing here is between 2 a.m. and 2.45 a.m. Okay. Uh, in the Oxford Street vicinity. He walks with a distinctive swagger um, and he also smokes in a, a particular way with his hand cupped over the cigarette. OK, that's quite distinctive. There's other uh, CCTV, I have to say, it's chilling stuff. Again, you, you think the suspect, this time with another woman. What are we looking at here? This CCTV is from earlier on, it's around about 2 a.m. Um, where the attack happened on Library Walk. We see another young lady walking down and she's followed by who we believe to be the suspect. We desperately need to speak to this female. We want her to come forward. We yeah. want to make sure that she's all right. She may even know who this man is. Yeah, that could be really, really important and an important key. Other CCTV. Now, these are people who were just out and about on that night. Let's take a look at them. Remind us of the date and the place. OK, this is... It's Halloween. It's the 31st of October. We're at the Alibi, which is a late-night bar on Oxford Street. These people are there when this man walks past. We want to speak to them. They may have seen him, they may recognise him. Yeah, that could be really important. Another thing that might have attracted people's attention was he ran, didn't he? I mean, you don't, all, you don't see that many people running late at night. He did. It was a very busy night. It was Halloween. Uh, people may have seen him running after the victim and believed that he was her boyfriend. We want them to come forward. We want anybody to come forward with information about this man. It all matters, John. Thank you very much uh, for now. A, a terrible crime that has had a terrible impact you can do something about it. If you recognise the man seen in that, I have to say, remarkably clear CCTV, do call now. There's the number, 0500 600 600. And if you've been a victim of crime, there is the victim support line. They're on 0845 30 30 900. Right, still to come, that new CCTV footage, which it's hoped could help finally crack the Alan Wood murder inquiry. And would you have the courage to step in and help someone being attacked on a train? I think it's just natural. I mean, uh, something called me, asked me to go, told me to go in, walk in the danger area and uh, do something. So Arjit was brave enough to take a stand, but he took a beating for his troubles. Just look at that. Police urgently want to speak to this man about it. Plus, the inside story of how dogged detectives sought help from scientists working with the American Kennel Club in California to help solve a brutal murder in West Yorkshire. We'd got that forensic link, and the chances of it being any other dog than Duchess was one in 484 million. But before all of that, Matthew has more of tonight's wanted faces. Well, first in this section is Francis Kane. The 36-year-old is wanted by North Wales Police for conspiracy to supply cocaine. Kane was arrested in North Wales in possession of more than £40,000 in cash hidden in his car. He was released on bail but hasn't been seen since. Kane is only 5 foot 2 inches tall, wears glasses and has a Liverpool accent. He has links to North Wales, Merseyside and North West England. Well, next is Quan Wang. 
39-year-old Wang is wanted for indecently assaulting a 30-year-old woman while working as a Chinese herbalist in London. He failed to turn up at court in 2005 but was found guilty in his absence. He's known to have lived in the Kilburn and Halsden areas of London and although there have been possible sightings of him in Wales, he could be anywhere in the UK, possibly still working as a Chinese doctor. Number seven tonight is James Michael Millay. Police want to speak to the 31-year-old following a robbery at a jeweller's in Scarborough last December, during which more than £50,000 worth of jewellery was taken. Millay, who's originally from Liverpool, has connections to Witness, Cheshire and Scarborough. However, police think he may now be in London. He has a very distinctive tattoo on his back and a scar on his left arm. Now, the last face on our board tonight is Swaley Wilshire. Police want to speak to the 24-year-old Wiltshire in connection with a violent robbery near Boston in Lincolnshire in June 2009, during which a couple were beaten, tied up and threatened with a knife. Wiltshire is six foot one and heavily built, and you can see he may be sporting a mullet-style haircut. He's from the travelling community and has links to Leicestershire, Suffolk, Cambridgeshire and Kent. See anyone you recognise? If so, call us 0500 600 600 or you can text at 63399, type crime, space, and then your message. And remember, all of our wanted faces stay on the website till they're caught. 16 months ago, Alan Wood, you'll remember, was subjected to what must be one of the most horrendous murders that we have ever featured. The people responsible still need to be caught. Well, detectives are back in the studio tonight with newly uncovered CCTV, which they hope will finally prompt someone to call in and name Alan Wood's sadistic killers. I have to try and not think about it. Otherwise, you'd go mad. But it's not easy. You do find yourself. People say, well, you're getting over it. You're looking well. Yes, I am getting over it. But I spend every hour, some part of that hour, thinking of it. It was amazing to find out just how many friends he had. It was amazing to find out what a popular young man he was. This is Alan Wood's home in the peaceful hamlet of Lound in Lincolnshire. It's where he lived for over five years and felt safe and comfortable. But just over a year ago, it's where he spent the last few moments of his life in agony, having been tortured, stabbed and mutilated. What happened behind these now boarded up windows is hard for anyone to comprehend. Alan was a very private man and liked to keep himself to himself. But we do now have a fuller picture of what we believe happened to him. We know that on Wednesday afternoon, Alan called in at the Morrison supermarket in Stamford. He then went for a pint in his local, the Willoughby Arms in Little Bytham, five miles from his home. That is the last sighting we have of Alan alive. But we don't believe he was actually disturbed until the following evening, the Thursday. We think he was in bed reading when something or someone caused him to approach the door. The true horrors of what happened in Alan's living room have never been revealed. But we need you to understand how dangerous and violent these people really are and why we must catch them. During that evening, Alan was subject to the most brutal and sustained attack imaginable. He was bound with tape, suffered repeated stab wounds to his head, stabbed in his eye and had his throat cut multiple times. As he was struggling for his life, his killers held him down so the savage attack could continue. Only after Alan had been killed and was laying on the floor did the attack reach its sickening conclusion. In an act that shocked even the most hardened of investigators, his killers attempted to decapitate him. Alan was a gentleman who ran a small gardening company and was well loved by his family and his friends. 
In fact, we can't find a single instance of anyone having fallen out with him in recent memory. So why was he murdered? Last year, we showed you footage of a man wearing a baseball cap and scarf using Alan's bank cards at a cash point. This was in the town of Bourne, less than two miles from Alan's home. And now, for the first time, we can reveal new images of the moments just before Alan's cards were used. The new footage is helping us gain a fuller picture of what we think happened in the town that night. Firstly, this man is seen hanging around the post office in Bourne. He's the same individual with the cap who will go on to use Alan's cards. It looks like he's waiting for someone. At the same time, this green Land Rover Discovery drives through the town. The Land Rover then continues into a car park. Around seven minutes later, a man, who we believe could be the driver of the Land Rover, walks out of the car park and in the direction of some of the town's cash points. Two men were then seen using Alan's bank cards at a nearby Sainsbury's. Over the next three days, Alan's cards were used at various cash points in Bourne and Stamford. In total, only a few hundred pounds were taken before the trail ran cold. Do you know who the man in the cap is? Or who was driving the Land Rover? They may have vital information which could help us. In the last 12 months, we've interviewed over 11,000 people. We've examined 3,000 pieces of evidence and scoured over 5,000 hours of CCTV. We've got fingerprint and DNA evidence, so all we need now is a name. I don't think any mother expects to lose, live longer than their children. I think I'm getting over the shock and coming to terms with Alan's death. Although it's not easy. What I'm not coming to terms with, and I find very difficult, is asking why. If I could find out why. Barb Barrick. Well, joining me now is Detective Superintendent Stuart Morrison, who is leading the investigation. We've spoken before, Stuart. You have decided tonight to release more details of the true horror of this crime. Yes. The way Alan met his death was absolutely horrific. I've released these details so people realise how dangerous these people are. Yeah, that's really important that people understand what these men are capable of. You also have this uh, new CCTV footage. Let's show it to people again and, and tell us what we're seeing. This is Thursday night in Bourne. This is a man using Alan's cards. He's smoking. He appears to be waiting for somebody. Right, and now we also have, also in Bourne, um, in the same area, we've got CCTV of, of this Land Rover. Just talk us through this. This is a Series 1 green Land Rover Discovery that turns to have been born again Thursday night, passes where that suspect is and parks in the town centre. Now, uh, there was cash taken on the card from Sainsbury's and you've got an e-fit that somebody who was uh, just coming out of Sainsbury's gave you yes. of one of the suspects. Just take us through the description. Once again Thursday evening, cash point at Sainsbury's about 10pm. Uh, this person and another man acting suspiciously, enough for the witness to contact us. Now, there's been a lot of forensics on this case. You've got some new forensics to reveal tonight. Mm. Tell us about it. We have uh, a footprint of a Converse shoe. Uh, those are the uppers, the two uppers. They're not normally sold in the UK. Right. One is a boxer boot, one is a trainer type shoe. OK, it could be important if people either recognise those or they know somebody who's not wearing them anymore, who used to wear them. That could be uh, important too. Exactly. You've got DNA, but it's not on the British database. Full DNA profile of a male, not on the UK database. We can use that to help to eliminate people. Yes, OK. Well, Stuart, that's all we've got time for, but thanks very much uh, for that update. I should mention, this is important, there are rewards totalling 60, 60,000 pounds. So if you think that you can help, you know what to do, 0500 600 600, or you can call the independent charity, Crime Stoppers, and do that anonymously. Let me give you their number again, 0800 treble 5 treble 1. Now, cast your minds back to Wednesday, the 23rd of June last year. If you're an England fan, then you might remember that it was the day they beat Slovenia to secure a place in the last 16 of the World Cup. But one man wasn't left celebrating that night after he was attacked and left permanently scarred simply for having the courage 
to speak out for a stranger who was being harassed himself on a train. Well, Detective Constable Sally Everett from British Transport Police is working on the case. She joins us. Can you fill me in on more of the details? Yes, well, as you said, it was the night of the England-Slovenia match. About 10pm, the victim, Arjep, boarded a train at Limehouse. People might remember him because he was wearing cycling clothing and he had his cycle with him. During the course of the journey, one man from a group, he noticed, had been verbally, racially abusive to another passenger and he'd started slapping him around the face. So Arjit stepped towards him to try and stop and intervene and the aggressor turned his attention to Arjit and totally unprovoked, he hit him in the face, causing the gash that you can see below his left eye. That's terrible, isn't it? I mean, just to be clear then, Arjit was attacked because he stepped in on somebody else's behalf. Yeah. Yes, he did. Trying to protect someone, he's ended up permanently scarred. Uh, but it was just something he felt that he had to do. I think I did, I feel I did the right thing. But it's not about being proud. It's about doing the right thing. And you believe in you've done the right thing. I would do it again. I would definitely do it again. If, uh, if necessary, yeah. If necessary, I would do it again. I mean, Arjit, apart from being a very decent bloke, he's a very br brave uh, bloke too. There's somebody you're keen to trace. Tell us about this man. Yes, there were no cameras on the train, but we have got CCTV images uh, from where he got on at Fenchurch Street Station and where he got off at Upminster Station. Who is it we're looking for? Just, just home in on the, It's the guy in the stripes, it's right? It's the man in the pink striped T-shirt. It's about age 20 to 30 years, sandy, blonde hair, quite short wearing three-quarter length beige shorts and there's a possibility that his name is James. OK, yeah, if people want a closer look, that, that T-shirt really is distinctive. It's got stripes going yes, in different directions. Very much Sally, so. for now, thanks very much. So, Arjit did his bits. Can you now help him out in return by identifying the blonde man in that distinctive stripy pink T-shirt? If so, do call us tonight. It's 0500 600 600. Now, Matthew has news of what's been happening with the cases we've featured before. Well, firstly, we have a reappeal for information about an item we featured last month. You may remember the case of grandmother Leah Brook, who died following an arson attack at her home in Sandal near Wakefield in November 2008. Well, officers in the studio that night received a call from someone who appeared to know a great deal of detail about the attack on Mrs Brook's home. The anonymous caller suggested there may be a link between that fire and a fire at another house a couple of months previously. Well, this is CCTV of that incident from August 2008, and it shows two men attempting to set fire to the gates of the house, which is less than a mile from where Mrs Brook lived. They pour some sort of accelerant, probably petrol, onto the gate and a traffic cone and set them alight, leaving a couple of seconds later in a red car along with a third man. Now, these men may have nothing to do with the arson at Mrs Brook's house, but the police do need to speak to them. Is this you, or can you tell us who they are? Well, the officer in charge of the case, who is here again in the studio tonight, is asking for that anonymous caller to ring back, and if they wish, to speak to him directly. So please, if you made that call, or you can think you can help, phone us on 0500 600 600. Now, news on a reconstruction we featured last March. The shocking case of a schoolgirl from Warwickshire who was sexually assaulted in her own home. Your mum and dad said you needed the boiler checking. They're not back yet. Well, I'm here now, so I might as well take a look. That was where he first decided to, you know, ruin her life, really. Well, last month, 37-year-old former police officer Daniel Lishman was sentenced to a minimum of 11 years in prison after pleading guilty to the rape and indecent assault of a girl under 13, as well as a string of other sexual offences, many against young children. The judge described Lishman as every parent's worst nightmare. Detectives now believe Lishman may have been responsible for many more offences, and tonight they'd like anyone who thinks they may have been a victim to get in touch. Please call 01926 415 761 to speak directly to a member of that inquiry team. That number is also on our website. Now, to an excellent result. Back in September, we showed you this footage of a pensioner being robbed on her own doorstep in Islington in North London. Well, following the programme, a 17-year-old youth was arrested. He pleaded guilty to robbery and was sentenced to 18 months in a young offenders institute. 
Finally, some news on a special item we featured on last month's show, the Metropolitan Police's Operation Amber Hill investigates the production of fake identity documents and we showed you images of five people officers wanted to identify after their photos appeared on multiple counterfeit items. Well, as a direct result of your calls, they had positive leads on all five. Well, the appeal worked so well, the Met now have another batch for you to have a look at. They are all on our website at bbc.co.uk forward slash crime watch. Now, when former boxer and family man Brian Keating was kidnapped and murdered in 2002, detectives feared that they would never be able to gather enough forensic evidence to bring his masked and gloved attackers to justice. But in what would become a groundbreaking investigation, detectives relied on scientists from California and a bull terrier dog named Duchess to help finally put the murderers behind bars. At the outset of the investigation, uh, it was pretty clear that this had all the hallmarks of a, a gangland-style killing. Brian Keating, a husband and father from Pontefract in West Yorkshire, had been kidnapped, beaten and dumped in a churchyard in Leeds. It was quite striking the way that he'd been left in the graveyard, in that he was propped up in the graveyard, looking across the gravestones in quite an eerie way. And, and to me, that sort of sent out a message from those that had done it. At the time that Brian Keating was killed, he was uh, operating as a second-hand car dealer. He was no angel. He had been on the wrong side of the law. But he'd never been to prison, and he was a loving and caring family man. Rachel Keating and the children clearly had been massively impacted on by, by what they'd seen. But uh, Rachel was strong, um, and we were able to uh, quickly sit down with Rachel and talk to her about what happened. The silent gunman who'd held her and her children at gunpoint was a man that she knew, an old family friend called Jasper Kosa. Kosa had known Brian for a decade, but in recent years they'd had some bitter disputes. Kosa had spent time in prison for a number of violent offences. He also had two older brothers, uh, Jitinda Kosa and Baldev Kosa. They too were violent men who'd served prison sentences. We wanted to establish if the brothers were in contact with each other that night, and they were. They were in regular contact. Oh, bro. Yes, mate, where are you? Cell site evidence showed that they were in the key scene areas in Pontefract, and where the car was burnt out at the critical times. The stolen Mondeo used to kidnap Brian had been abandoned in a pub car park 16 miles away in Leeds, where they torched it and fled the scene, sending the evidence up in flames. But they made a mistake. The offenders left us a gift, a real gift in the boot, and that was the sledgehammer. Brian's blood was found on the sledgehammer, but there was no DNA link to the attackers. We wanted to know where the sledgehammer came from, and there were extensive inquiries that revealed a sledgehammer was manufactured by a company, was distributed by another company, and actually, the only people that retailed it were home base. The store in Wakefield had sold two sledgehammers on the afternoon of the 15th of October. 
when we looked at the CCTV on that Tuesday afternoon, we were not shocked to see Jaspal and Jatinda Kosa walk into the store and leave with a sledgehammer each in their hands. The evidence was mounting against the Kosa brothers, but the police knew that they didn't act alone. As we looked more closely at who the Kosas had been in contact with in the weeks prior and on those critical dates, one name kept cropping up, Daniel McGowan. McGowan was also known to the police. He had a string of previous convictions and lived just 400 yards from the church cemetery where Brian's body had been dumped. By now, we were building a real picture of what had happened. But we were lacking in forensic evidence that would knit it together. What we did have was a curious amount of dog hairs on Brian Keating's body and on his face. Brian Keating didn't have a dog. But McGowan did. He had a bull terrier cross called Duchess. McGowan was seen leaving his address in a white van about 3 a.m. that Wednesday morning. It's my belief that he was taking Brian Keating's body to dump it at the churchyard. And it was Duchess that would give us that crucial evidence to link it forensically. But McGowan was busy getting rid of everything that could link him to the murder, including Duchess and the van. Detectives eventually tracked her down to an address in Scotland and retrieved the van from its new owners, who are now in Spain. And although the van looked like it had been thoroughly cleaned, bingo, there were still dog hairs underneath the passenger seat. I now needed some control samples from Duchess. So I'll just need you to hold her head up. So I needed blood from Duchess, I needed saliva from Duchess, and I needed some dog hairs from Duchess. The police wanted to use these samples to get a DNA match to the hair found on Brian's clothing and inside the van. But in 2002, it just wasn't that simple. I was told by the experts in this country that, yes, they could develop the DNA from the dog hairs, but they wouldn't be able to give me any statistical analysis of whether they were connected with Duchess or any other dog. Detective Superintendent Pervin began to research canine DNA profiling in America and came across forensic scientist Joy Halverson. She'd helped the US police in the past and crucially, she'd also developed a canine DNA database. It seemed to fit perfectly with exactly what I wanted. It was just in a different country. And so arrangements were made to take the samples across to California. Joy got busy in her lab using a process originally designed to help the US Kennel Club verify a dog's pedigree now, it was at the heart of a major criminal investigation. Ten days later, she had a result. We'd got that forensic link. And the chances of it being any other dog than Duchess was one in 484 million. Amazing. In court, they were all indignant. They showed no remorse. But thanks to the crucial evidence that Duchess provided. After a three-month trial, the jury returned unanimous verdicts. This was a really groundbreaking case. And there was one final twist in the tale. It turned out that Duchess never actually belonged to McGowan. She'd been stolen two years previously, and now, having unwittingly helped solve a brutal murder, was at last reunited with her real owners. What a tale. I think I've seen it all, and then I see something I would never have expect, expected. Um, the thing I'm not clear on is why this man was murdered. 
Well, motive is still the one thing that's unclear. Brian had known the Costa brothers for years. They'd been friends, they'd done business, but there'd been a big falling out. Detectives talk about a feud that had got worse in the weeks leading up to the murder. Brian had been attacked by the Costas using a baseball bat once he'd been in his car. There was a nasty fight in a club in Leeds. And then the murder itself, I mean, astonishing levels of violence. The post-mortem showed 102 separate injuries on Brian's body. I mean, the details are just too distressing to go into. Right. Uh, the sentence reflected that, did it? Yes, it did. Uh, two of the Kosa brothers, uh, Jaspal and Jatinda, got life with a minimum of 21 years. McGowan got a minimum of 14 years. And Baldav Kosa got eight years for assisting the others. The jury just simply didn't buy their story. It was full of holes. McGowan, for example, claimed he'd sold the van and gone to Scotland before the murder, and yet the jury was shown police footage of a surveillance operation, a completely separate one, that by chance had filmed McGowan in Leeds the day after the murder, in his van, with his dog, carrying a green petrol can that he was dumping that they think was used to torch the getaway car. And McGowan also claimed that he hadn't been in contact with the Costa brothers for years, and yet the telephone evidence showed they'd been in constant contact before and after the murder, and then all of the gangs simultaneously ditched their mobile phones. Yeah, that's a tell. That's a definite mm. tell. Um, but the evidence up to a point, I mean, even the, the two brothers buying the sledgehammers in the DIY story, you know, it, it, it seemed important, it was important, but it was circumstantial. It was only yeah. when they got the dog hairs and matched them that they knew that they could bang these guys yeah, to Yeah, that was the critical link because it placed Brian's body in McGowan's van and McGowan was the link to the Costa brothers. And yeah. as soon as that became clear, I mean, the puzzle was almost unlocked. I mean, this is an area of forensic science that's, that's new. Yeah. You saw in the film, the Americans are ahead of us. I think they first used it in a major murder case in Seattle in 1998. But here, we're catching up. We've established this uh, database. And actually, since this case, there have been important prosecutions, a rape prosecution, uh, another murder prosecution and right. conviction where animal DNA has been absolutely critical in getting the result. What a step forward. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Now, you can find out lots more information about that case, as I say, completely compelling, on our website, bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. You can also have another look at all of tonight's appeals, including our reconstructions and Matthew's wanted faces, as well as lots of exclusive video only available online. Now Matthew's got news of what's been happening. I think it's been busy on the phones tonight, Matthew. Because it has been really busy. We have had calls on every major appeal we've made. Let's start with uh, Sam Gadira, the student, the murder in Sydenham, because uh, he, you remember, was stabbed through the heart. Now, police appealing for witnesses who come off the train at Penge Station. Well, we've had some calls from witnesses on that train, so that's very encouraging. And also, police had information about the wallet. You remember the ID card, the student card that was in that wallet. So, new information on that. The horrifying rape in Manchester City Centre. Uh, remember that man who uh, distinctly cups his cigarette, a uh, distinctive swagger as he walks? Well, lots of interesting calls. Anonymous person calling in with crucial information. Please, please call back. More on our update. Yeah, that's it for now. It, it looks like it has been a very busy night on the phones. If you haven't called yet, the lines do stay open until midnight tomorrow, so there's still plenty of time to call. We're going to be back with a full update at 10 past 11. For viewers in Wales, it's 11.15. Northern Ireland, 11.35 tonight. Crime Watch is going to be back in a month. We will see you at 10 past 11 for the update. Thanks for your calls. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. Yes, just a reminder again, as Kirsty said, that Crime Watch update can be seen at 11.35, which is later than you may be expecting. You've followed the headlines, now get behind. We were unfortunately forced to leave because of economic conditions or religious conditions. We should have praise where praise is due for what they've contributed to the development of the West, to the world almost. 43 men have ruled America from this building.
Many were from families with roots here. Are you related to an American president? Here a chance to see this programme again on the BBC iPlayer at bbc.co.uk slash iPlayer. And also there you can catch up on Fergal Keane's The Story of Ireland series. Both episodes shown so far, The Age of Invasions and The Age of Conquest, are there in the series Catch Up. questions away from winning a hundred thousand pounds could you take the pressure work. now imagine what it feels like winning a secret fortune the national lottery secret fortune including the national lottery draws saturday at eight on bbc one and bbc one hd why are we here where do we come from these are the most enduring of questions it's part of human nature to want to find out the answers every piece of you and me was forged in the furnaces of space. Ultimately, we are part of the universe, so its story is our story. And what a story. What a majestic story. Professor Brian Cox returns to BBC Two. Join him and discover the wonders of the universe. Starts Sunday at nine. Well, tonight's lineup may be a little different from what you might have been expecting here on BBC One Northern Ireland. Mrs. Brown's Boys on the way in 10 minutes' time after a later than planned update from the Crime Watch studio. And welcome back. We have had a very good night on the phones and let's hope lots of very useful calls. Let's start with a reminder of our first appeal tonight, the murder of 24-year-old student Stan Gadira just two weeks ago. Something had happened, it was so unlike him not to turn up. And I tried to call him. I remember sitting there thinking, please answer your phone, please answer your phone, please just pick up the phone. Well, the tragedy happened on the 12th of this month, and leading the investigation is DCI Lawrence Smith. This was a 24 year old man stabbed through the heart. He died from that single injury. How have the calls gone tonight? Now, we've had a good response, a good response, but we need everybody that was on that train that arrived at Penge Station at 9.41 to contact police. Okay. They left that station moments before Sam was fatally stabbed in the heart. We need these people. It's crucial they contact police now. OK, and people can look on our website. They can find out. They might know themselves if they were on the train. If they've forgotten, they regularly get the train. Look on the website. Please Thanks do. very much, Lawrence, for now. Matthew, over to you. Now, the appalling case of great-grandmother Edith Stewart. In October last year, she'd settled down for the night in her care home in Cleveland's in Lancashire when someone deliberately set fire to her bed. She suffered 50% burns and died just over a day later. Well, Detective Superintendent Neil Asin from Lancashire Police joins us here. And, Neil, what's come in? Well, we've had a significant number of calls uh, around other cases that have occurred around the country and give some potential lines of inquiry about how we may go about solving this case. And what do you still need to know? What we haven't had is that uh, one person who's wrong and who knows what's gone on, who's been taken to somebody's conference and gives the information we need about this appalling case where a 96-year-old grandmother had been burned to death in her bed. It's an appalling case. She was suffered for 30 hours, 50% burns. Somebody out there knows who's done this, and we need to call, to call this as soon as possible. As you say, 30 hours she suffered. I mean, it goes without saying her family are desperate for that snippet of information for somebody to actually come forward with something. Yes, you've seen, I've seen tonight, they're a lovely family. They've had their grandmother, their great-grandmother, their mother cruelly taken from them. She's suffered the final 30 hours of agonising life. 
Uh, she was 96 years old, would have quite happily got to 100. Please, somebody ring us. Please, somebody tell us. Neil, good luck. If you have any information, please do call in. Kirsty. Now, earlier we showed you, I have to say, there were incredibly clear images of this man who was suspected of raping a young woman in the centre of Manchester in October. Do you recognise him? And because I knew my boyfriend was only a couple of minutes away, I just decided to um, start running, really. Um, as I was, I was excited, I was giddy to see him. <laughs> just don't see people the same anymore. Like, I was a really trusting person and would probably, like... Um, but now, you just look at me and I'm always thinking, is could it be you, is it you? And it shouldn't have to be like that. It, Yeah. Devastating for that young woman. Well, joining me now, Detective Sergeant John Connor, who's heading up the investigation. How did the phones go for you tonight? We've had a really, really pleasing amount of calls, some really good information coming in. OK, that's great. There are lots of distinctive things about this, the attack, of this attacker. People can look on the website, but there's a woman that you want to trace. Something happened to her earlier the same evening. I'm still really anxious to trace the first young woman that we saw on the CCTV being followed by who I believe to be our suspect. Right. I want to make sure that she's all right. She may also hold vital evidence for us. OK, it was the early hours of the 31st of October last year. Were you chased? Were you followed by a man in that area? For now, over to Matthew. Now, on the night of the England versus Slovenia World Cup match in June of last year, a man was attacked after he went to the aid of a fellow passenger on a train in East London. And then all of a sudden, he rose his hand and he just slapped uh, this, uh, this man on the face about three times, if I'm not wrong. So he slapped him quite hard on the face three times. And in the meantime, still swearing and verbally abusing him. Then I felt something had to be done quite quickly, because he was, that was enough. Enough was enough there at the, at the point. Well, Detective Constable Sally Everett from British Transport Police is here. It's been a really good night for you, hasn't it? Yeah, I've had a fantastic response. At least 15 people have phoned in, and a large number of those are naming the same person, and he lives in the right area. Well, that sounds like good news. Now, Arjun, intervene to help a fellow passenger. You still need that passenger to actually come forward, don't you? Yes, yes. If, he, if he's watching the programme at all, it's an East, East uh, Asian gentleman and he probably has got quite a bit more information that would be useful to us. Sally, good luck with that. Kirsty. Thank you. Thanks. Now, Alan Wood was the man you remember brutally murdered in his own Lincolnshire home 16 months ago. He was subjected to the most terrifying attack imaginable. But detectives hope that new CCTV pictures might now provide a crucial breakthrough. Where is it? <laughs> I'm getting over the shock and coming to terms with Alan's death. Although it's not easy. I don't think any mother expects to lose, live longer than their children. Well, yes, Stuart Morrison is here. How have the phones been for you? The phones have been busy. We've had an encouraging number of calls on various subjects, CCTV, EFIT and the Land Rover. OK, that's good news. The, the other thing, and, and it, could be, you know, it could be really important, is you came to us today with this new information about the shoe print. Yes. Tell us about that. The Converse footwear, which is either a high-top boot style or a shoe style of trainer, not normally sold direct into the UK. OK, and people can look on our website for details of those, as you say, not sold in the UK and therefore distinctive. Did somebody, you know, wear them and suddenly stop wearing them? Did somebody try to get rid of them? Did you find them in a bin? That could all be crucial. We should also tell people that relating to this all together, there is... How much is the reward? A total of £60,000. OK, thank you very much for that. Matthew, over to you now. Kirsty, great night on the Most Wanted Faces because uh, a lot of calls for this guy, firstly. Swaley Wiltshire, 36 calls, 22 emails. Don't forget he's accused of violent robbery near Boston. A lot of calls also. Anastasios Papas, who's accused of people trafficking. We've had uh, calls with several people and sightings, both in the same place. CCTV, quickly. Peterborough armed robbery, that very interesting motorbike. Well, a lot of interesting information on that bike. Great night, Kirsty.
OK, busy. That's everything for now. The phone lines are going to be open until midnight tomorrow night. Let me tell you the number again, 0500 600 600. You can find lots more information. Take a look again on all of tonight's appeals on our website. You know the address is bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. We're going to be back with more cases 